Good morning. I'm Tina Cadini. And I'm Justin Johnson. And we want to welcome you to Fellowship of Faith. Happy Daylight Savings Time, everybody. Uh, everybody remember? Are you guys watching this on uh, Not Live? Yeah, you wake up an hour late <laughs> this morning. I almost did, but thankfully iPhones do it automatically. So. How many of you guys have been waiting six months for your car clock to be set to the right time? <laughs> I don't think anyone's waiting to do that, nah. but I, don't, I had to do it this morning. Yeah. I actually change it, and it, it's hard to remember how to do that. <laughs> What's the button you What's use the again? Button? Yeah. Anyway, we're glad that you're with us today. If you want to give us a like, let us know that you're here. Uh, share the Facebook live stream because people are watching and we're reaching people. Very exciting. Yes, it's going all over the place. Countries, yeah. states, very exciting. So thank you everyone who has been sharing, and please continue to do so. Yes. Um, if you want to text in and let us know that you're here, uh, they're going to put the number up on the screen, I hope. And it's, let's see if you can remember this, 815-402-0607. I would have gotten the 815 that did, so you did better <laughs> than I would. I've been working. I've been trying. All right. Um, what else do we what need to, we have? we have on here? Like or subscribe, we talked about that already. Ah, today is the service, is the service. Oh, today we're talking about Isaiah, yep. and we're talking about... The servant who suffers. And the God who suffers with us, yep. and more than suffering with us, who suffers for us. That's a great uh, comparison to, to each other. Uh, it's interesting to say that, yes, we servants who suffer, but God also suffers with us. Yes. We're not alone regardless what we're going through. Yep. It's in, yep. never quite put that and together. And we're, we're talking about Isaiah 52, <laughs> and it's a long passage, and... It's too much for a screen to handle, so make sure you have your Bibles so bring handy. bring a Bible. A nice old paper Bible if you have it, because yep. it'll be easier. And you're going to want to take notes, so bring a pen, too. And write in the margins of your Bible. I highly recommend that. I used right. to do the Bibles in-house here, uh -huh. and it would be kind of cool when I get the Bible again. Like, oh, and I other remember when notes. I wrote on it. Yeah. 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 Uh, right. Let's see. You guys, it's been a long week, and I'm tired. I think you're tired, too, with the daylight savings. <laughs> yes. You were late for the meeting this morning. I was a little late this morning, but I think it was more of my activities yesterday than daylight savings <laughs> uh <-huh>. time. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so I wanted to let you guys know that I came to the morning meeting, uh -huh. and at the end of it, they have communion for, like, everybody who's doing the volunteer right. work. And so I woke up late this morning, did not have breakfast, so I got to have communion. It was the very first thing that yeah. I ate today. And how do they feel? Like every other time. <laughs> Nothing's really different, right? <laughs> you know, which is kind of cool about God, that as incredible as he is and as unique as he is, he's still normal. Definitely, yeah. no matter what. Yeah, you hear about people, like, getting baptized, and, like, yeah, I came out and I felt the same. Like, okay, you, you kind of expect this super high, right, like, I'm ah. a super person now. No, you're, you're the same person, only different. Different in your own way, right? Yeah, different, different in God's way. Right, exa exactly, exactly, yeah. because you don't know how you're going to feel different, but, yeah, yeah, you're still different. So... I guess that's a long way of saying we are having communion today. So if you Maybe. want to participate with us, get some bread and some wine. Or wheat thins. Or wheat thins mm -hmm. and grape juice. I heard of churches that have like little kits, a uh, communion kit. I've kits, heard about that too. Where it's yeah. all hermetic, hermetically, medically sealed. Where like you got a sealed wafer on one side and you flip it over and there's a sealed grape juice on the other side. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I thought it was just kits with the wafers and a little. Yeah, grape no, juice or something, no. but in the same packet. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Is there a Lent in the box this week, too? Uh, there's always Lent in the box. Uh, we're not going to talk to anybody okay. afterwards. It's a little bit logistically difficult because we're in a tight space back yeah, here. Yeah. But so no special guests this time. but Yeah. And hopefully, maybe, we'll have people coming in talking to us. They're talking about yeah. getting us a do not disturb or, or on air, on air sign, button. So we don't. That's weird. That's <laughs> weird. That's weird. It's also cool, though, at the same time. Weird, but cool. We're different that way. I guess so. See, yeah. we're disagreeing here. We're not agreeing. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Hey, we're going we're gonna to let you guys get ready for worship. The band is starting to head up there, and uh, we'll see you at the end of service. Enjoy.
Good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to FOF in house online. Uh, let's stand and sing.
Morning, everyone. Guys, good to see you today. Happy Daylight Savings Time, too. I mean, it was like, yeah, give, give it up, boo, right? It's, <laughs> hey, you won't be booing at 7 o'clock tonight. That's all I got to say, right? It, it's uh, good to see you, though, today, guys, in, a, in our live stream community. Thanks for just tuning in with us this morning. Those of you who don't know me, my name is David Gadini, pastor here at Fellowship of Faith. And what we've been doing through this season that Christians call Lent is going through a section of Isaiah called the Servant Songs. It's all about how God works. And, and, and all of us have wondered this at time. Like, God, how do you actually like, work? Or how are you working? Or, or how do I see when you're working before us? And Isaiah's journey through this is showing how God predominantly works through this character that Isaiah will call the servant. And in the prophet Isaiah, there are five poems or five songs that give five different perspectives or pictures on what this servant is like and how God goes about doing his work in this world. And we can look at the servant as a glimpse of that. To date so far, we've seen three different pictures of this servant. We've seen that the servant is doused by God in God's spirit. And what he does, he does in the power and and, and, and just glory of God's spirit to bring justice to the world, to right wrongs. But unlike the way that so many people clamor for justice today, he will not, and I love the imagery, snuff out a smoldering wick or break a bruised reed. But in some very other kind of way, God is bringing good where there's evil and right out of wrong and seeing that his, his goodness and righteousness and justice is done in the world. It's one picture we get from Isaiah. There's a second picture that we've seen where the servant is God's secret weapon. He's described as a a shining sword hidden in the hand or a, a, a polished arrow hidden in the quiver that he is both unexpected and yet absolutely effective. And we saw that there was a third picture as well that the servant is resolute. He's determined. He, as Isaiah puts it, sets his face like flint. And he is resolute in carrying out God's mission of bringing reconciliation to us in the world, to the world itself, to God, even at his own personal expense. And today we get to picture number four. This fourth song or poem, this fourth perspective on this servant and therefore on how God works. And I want to invite you to follow along because this passage gets longer. It's way too long to put on the screen. We're going to anchor the passage, you know, address up there, but you're going to need to follow along with it. And I don't want you to just hear it. I want you to to, to read it. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 And for about a chapter, we're going to go through this journey of this fourth picture of this servant. If you don't know where to go on your phone right now, you can go quickly to any kind of Bible app that's out there. You can just Google Bible and, 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 you know, a thousand options will come up. BibleGateway.com is one website I particularly like. If you don't have the YouVersion app on your phone, I highly encourage you to download that before you leave today and have 800 Bibles on your phone with you wherever you go. Um... But follow along with me. And as I read this, you know, you take your translation of choice. I, I tend to be like, like an NIV guy. Um, it, it's what I grew up with. It's what I know well. Um, and so it's kind of where I dance. But, but I've always found value in, in looking at how other translations will put things. You follow along on the translation of your choice, what you like best. But as you read, let me share this out of a different translation. It's called The Message. One that I've come to like a lot. And dare I say, if you're ever reading the Bible and you're either A, just going, I, I have no idea what this is about. Or B, utterly bored. Try it in The Message. Try it in the message and see if through this translation or paraphrase, 
If God doesn't work in that in some kind of new and fresh way and, and engage your thinking in a different way, again, you don't need to follow along in the message with me. But maybe as I read this and you look at the words on your page, it brings things to light. Isaiah 52, verse 13, our fourth picture of how God works through a servant. Just watch my servant blossom, exalted, tall, head and shoulders above the crowd. But he didn't begin this way. At first, everyone was appalled. He didn't even look human. A ruined face, disfigured past recognition. Nations all over the world will be in awe, taken aback. Kings shocked into silence when they see him. For what was unheard of, they'll see with their own eyes. What was unthinkable, they'll have right before them. Who believes what we've heard and seen? Who? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? The servant grew up before God. A scrawny seedling. A scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him. Nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over. A man who suffered. He knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures but it was our sins that did that to him. That ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who have wandered off and gotten lost. We've all gone and done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong on him, on him. He was beaten. He was tortured. But he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was led off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man. And though he'd never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true, still, it's what God had in mind all along. To crush him with pain. The plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin. So that he'd see life come from it. Life. Life and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Out of that terrible travail of soul... He'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant will make many righteous ones. And he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and he didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause 
of all the black sheep. Whew. Doesn't that one just get kind of, get in you a bit? Yahweh is a God who suffers. Isaiah says many things about Yahweh, uh, about God. He describes God in so many ways. God is exalted. God is all-powerful. God is creator. God is holy. God is eternal. God is compassionate. But Isaiah describes Yahweh and the pages of the Bible drip with it too, that God is something more. God is also a God who suffers. Yahweh suffers. I love how the Jewish theologian and philosopher Abraham Heschel puts this. He'll write that God does not just command and expect obedience, but he is moved and affected by the suffering in this world and he reacts accordingly. The pages of the Bible are filled with a God who is affected and moved, a God who feels, a God who suffers, a God who regrets and relents and repents, a God not who is distant and above it all, but a God who is deeply, deeply affected by it. For many people, this doesn't square with their perception of God. For many, God is seen as someone who is above it all, distant, detached, removed. And to suggest even that God might suffer well, is to open up things that they just can't come to terms with. Because to suggest that God suffers, doesn't that not also suggest that God might then also be vulnerable? And if God is vulnerable, is then God not also weak or imperfect? Entire schools of theology will write about the attributes of God, talking about how God is impassable, how God is immutable, all ways of just describing how God must be above being able to be affected by suffering. And yet I love how Abraham Heschel in his most popular work called The Prophets, read it sometime, it is a good use of your life, will talk in theological terms, in, in apologetic terms, even if I could put it that way, that conventional thinking about God probably owes more that your thinking, Christian thinking, Jewish thinking, Muslim thinking, Western thinking about God arguably is influenced more by the Greek philosophers than by Moses and Isaiah, that God is not so much the unmoved mover as much as he is the most moved mover. That God is affected by things and suffers because of, with, and for his people. How does that square with your perception of God? I don't know. How is God all powerful? How is God unchanging and yet affected simultaneously? I don't know, but I know this. The Bible's filled with paradoxes. God is one, yet God is three. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. You who seek to save your life will lose it, while you who seek to lose your life for Christ in the gospel will find it. I don't know. What I know is that the pages drip. The pages of the Bible drip with a God who is affected, feels, 
and is moved, a God who suffers. And if you can't come to grips with that, may I just challenge you this morning to ask yourself if your perception of God comes more from Plato and Aristotle than it does from Jesus. I love how the writer to the Hebrews puts this. Let me read this to you from Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 10. He says, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. That Jesus himself was perfected through suffering. That what God is doing in this world was perfected through suffering. Let me keep reading. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by fear of death, by their fear of death. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You know what it means? God knows what it's like. Your struggles, your temptations, God knows what it's like. Every struggle and temptation you faced, Jesus felt. He felt. And he knows what it's like. You don't go alone. That whatever you're suffering, whatever you're suffering, and even whatever the cause, he knows what it's like. It's a picture that God is not detached or unable to sympathize as the writer of Hebrews puts it because, oh man, I've been there. I've been there and I feel it. I feel it and I felt it. I felt it and I know it. Oh, I know what it's like. That God identifies with you in your suffering because God is a God who suffers. He suffers because of the sins of the world. Think about it. We sin all the time. Most of the time, it ain't a second thought. It doesn't seem to be a big deal. We got away with it. No one really got hurt. Not too much got disrupted by, you know, know, we all kind of spin our own narrative on this, right? But have you ever thought that that that, that actually hurts God? That God feels pain? How much less likely are we to do things when we see the pain it causes in someone's life that we love? When we see what hurts our kid or our spouse or our friend? It kind of serves as a warning light to us, doesn't it? To go, oh, I shouldn't do this. I need to be about this. This is affecting them. I mean, unless you're a sociopath, we all do this naturally. Unless your heart is hardened. We all almost do this instinctually. But do we ever pause to think, that the cruel things that I think, the callous things that I say, the things that I neglect and don't occupy myself with, that God is actually suffering. As a result, God suffers. He suffers because of the sins of people. But not just because of them, he suffers with them too. And the suffering that you face, that we face, 
He plunges himself in the midst of it, and more, the picture of the servant is that he suffers for them too. That not just because, not just with, but even on behalf of, that God suffers for you. Have you ever thought about this? That God chooses to suffer to spare you from suffering. That God steps in to take the brunt in ways you will never realize and to take it upon himself and not like it's just a but in a way that affects him deeply. The message and good news of the Bible is that God sent his son precisely to suffer on behalf of this world. To die for the people of this world. To to suffer for the people of this world. To take the suffering and death that they deserve and take it upon himself. Jesus suffers for you. Yahweh suffers because of, with, and on behalf of his people, and he works through suffering. It's not just an unfortunate event. It's not just a, gotta deal with this one. No, for whatever odd reason, this picture of the servant is that God chooses, for whatever reason, to work through suffering. Tell me, would you have chosen a different way? Hmm, we got three options here. Let's pick the suffering one. That's God's way. God has chosen to work through suffering. It doesn't mean we'll always know why we're suffering. It doesn't mean that every time we suffer, God is setting us up for some some greater agenda like a pawn in a game. But it does assure us that our suffering can have meaning. And that through it, God can work good even out of the most horrible and horrendous of situations. And that God will get his work done, not by circumventing that path, but by plunging with you through it right till the end. A servant with a face like flint, resolute, no matter the cost to himself, Choosing the path of suffering with you. And so we see in the prophet Isaiah, Israel suffering. And God saying, your suffering will have meaning and impact. Bringing light and atonement to the nations that don't know me around. We see Isaiah suffering. Suffering and struggling on behalf of the people of Israel. We see Jesus embodying it all. Suffering as God's servant for his people and the people that don't call him by name. All as a reflection of suffering and we too will be called to suffering as well. That God doesn't say if. But when Jesus suffered, and so we who identify with him and by his name, yes, we will suffer too. All of this is a reflection of a God who suffers, a God who suffers. For you. There's two pictures I want to show you. And and I like showing them in distinction and contrast to one another, representing two not just major belief systems, but ways that people think about God. I think of this picture on the left. This giant opulent statue of Buddha in Sri Lanka, a place marked by poverty and suffering, marked by it like so many corners of the world. And here we have an image of God. We have an image of God who is clean 
and serene and pristine. Calm. Quiet. Removed. Unfazed and untouched. Above the suffering, at least as it's believed to exist, of this world. It's interesting and it should make you think that that never became the primary symbol of Christianity. No, its primary symbol became something very different instead. A device of torture and suffering. A symbol of execution and shame. No matter how much gold you put on the cross you wear around your neck, no matter how much you adorn this ancient symbol of Christianity, no matter how pretty you try to make it, never forget what it truly is. A primary way of understanding who God is, a God who suffers in the most horrific ways for you. This is the God of Isaiah, the God of the Bible, Jesus, the suffering one, Yahweh, the suffering one. And a vision of how he works in our world today and every day. until he comes again. Oh, and that vision? Did you read it? Did you remember it? Did you mark it? Did it jump out at you? The glory? The reward? The hope? The promise? The exaltation? of the one who suffered for me and you. Because of the path he chose to go through. Path of suffering. What does the great hymn of Revelation say? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Glory, glory, is he, to him who sits on (laughs) that throne of glory, worthy is he. What do the angels surround the throne room of heaven sing? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. How was he identified, the lamb who was slain? Worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. It is the hymn song worthy of the God who suffers. I want to invite you to rise. And let's share in that that ancient hymn of glory.
God, you are holy of holies. You, the lamb who was slain, you are worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You and you alone who suffered on our behalf, you and you alone now high and lifted up, you and you alone who identify with us in our suffering. May our hearts, may our knees, may our hands, may our voices, may they be bowed before you and lifted up, exalting you above all things. Glory be your name, O God. Glory. Glory be your name. Amen. 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 And with all the joy you can muster, with every ounce of what you can offer to God, Amen. Amen. To him be the glory. Now and forevermore. Amen. I want to invite you to take a seat. I just want to end the service now. But we commune today. We commune today as a way of receiving Jesus' suffering on our behalf. And we commune today as a way of identifying and dare I say even sharing or or maybe better opening ourselves to pick up our cross and follow him. The Apostle Paul who knew suffering well would write to early believers, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do I believe it? Do I trust it? 
Will I walk the path that you've called me to follow? To be a people who are not guilty of ignoring God, dismissing God, or even just listening to God. but willing to follow him as well. In the early chapters of Acts, this amazing narration of life in the, in the church, Luke will describe what it was like. A people who devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer where everyone was filled with awe. As many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles where all the believers were together and had everything in common and where they would sell their possessions and goods to give to those who had need describes how every day they would continue to meet in the temple courts, how they broke bread in their homes with glad hearts, with sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people and how the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. It is a picture. It is a dream. God has for us today. Each week this Lent, we've been trying to take seriously God's call to examine ourselves. Highlighting a different aspect. Today I want to talk about gratitude. Sacrifice. And the invitation to self-suffering, if you will. For him, ways that we are able to to pour forth the wonderful gifts that God has given you. You could see how the early Christians devoted themselves to these kinds of things. And this morning, I invite you to examine yourself against this. If you're new with us today, we're just inviting you to something we've been doing this Lent, to take a few moments to pray, to be honest. And as I guide you through a series of questions this morning, to examine yourself in light of them before God. Close your eyes if you need to, if it helps you focus. Whatever you do, just make it a time. A time of communication and connection with him. How would you answer these? I trust God more with my time, my finances, even my very life than I did a year ago. Yes or no? How would you answer that today? I'm more generous than I was a year ago. Generous with my church, my family, the needs of others in this world. I practice hospitality in my home and with my possessions. I seek to serve and regularly do so. 
here at FOF or elsewhere. I tithe. I give regularly, proportionately, from the first of what I receive and not remainder, sacrificially in a way that affects me. I feel more gratitude towards God today. than I did a year ago. Examine yourself, Paul says, to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves, and as the message translation will put it, if you see that you fail the test, we'll just do something about it. Not to earn God's love for you. That is inviolate and unchanging. but as a way of picking up your cross and to walk the way of Jesus and identify with him and that path of giving and sacrifice and suffering. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Merciful God, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. What I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Nothing good lives in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. I delight in your law, but another law is at work within me, waging war against my mind and making me a prisoner of sin. O oh, wretched person I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who suffered and died for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. Hear this. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It was Jesus who went the way of suffering and death on the very night he was betrayed who took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body. Broken for you. It was Jesus on the night he was to be betrayed that after that supper he took a cup and gave thanks to God in the midst of it and said, take and drink, all of you, because this, this is my blood. This is my blood of a new covenant, a new promise. God is making you. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Come. Do this. And remember the God I am. And what I'm about to do for you.
Thank everybody so much for being here today and to also all of our live streamers. So um, thank you for joining us this morning. May God be with you. May he bless you. May he keep you safe and healthy this week. And just do your best to commit to becoming closer to him, right? Just like Pastor Dave was saying, be in the word, pray, take him with you every day. Um, and, and then we'll come back next week and... Can't, Can't wait, wait to, to see, see you then. then. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for covering for me. <laughs> Guess I should have talked, talked a little longer, huh? Good. I didn't let you. Maybe you want to ask some questions or something. So. <laughs> there it is. It's on. <laughs> It's fun, right? It's fun. We're having fun. We get to worship our king. So here we go. Let's do it. Yes, if I did, I'm 
good? Are we good? We're good. You guys, I love Barbie Wells. Shout out to Barbie. I would go to an aerobics class if she led that class. Oh, for sure. I love She's, Barbie. Her voice is so calming, too. Yes. Even yes, and so, she has so much energy. Yes, all the time. And it seems effortless. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> We're at, what a great service today. It was a great service. Music was fantastic. The message was... Oh, duh. yeah. Invigorating. And, and I got to give Dave props because he's a great preacher, but yeah. Isaiah itself oh, is just... Yeah. The words that they... Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm, really gets you, gets you going a little bit. It does. It was, it was a great, it does. great service. <sighs> All right, so before I forget, we talked about Justin. lawn mowing, right? So, and we said who to contact. We contact Sarah Bodinas at sbodinas at fellowshipoffaith.org, I believe that is a... Should be. I think they're going to post it. Post it on, on, on it's the It's on screen. Excellent. Good job, tech guys. So go ahead and uh, if you were wanting to volunteer, go through, contact her, and she will walk you through the process. I wanted to get that out there before I forgot. So. Good job. We also want to pray for you guys. So let us, well, two things. Let us know that you were here. You can text here to 815 Two four zero oh six oh seven. Yeah, hey, team. teamwork. We can also we also want to pray for you guys. Same number eight one five two four zero zero six zero seven. So text prayer and the next it's response like little, will be something like, "What well, can we pray for yeah, you?" Yeah, there'll be a little box. You click on the box and type. And in those your prayers, prayers do not go into the void. They actually go to our elders yep. and they pray for you. So please I, let us know what we can pray for you. I can speak from experience. They go to directly to me because I am one of the elders and we will pray for you guys. Yeah, I uh, want to let you know that. Um, during Lent, we're doing this thing called faith training. You guys can go to our Fellowship of Faith webpage, yep. fof.org. Yeah, I might be Fellowship of Faith. Fellowship of Faith. Yeah. Anyway, org. on there, there's a, a secondary page called Faith Training, and they have like weekly questions that you can go through. And there's different intensities, if you want to call yeah. it. You have yeah. mild, regular, and intense. intense. Yep. So click on that, and it'll take you through. And if you guys are interested in like a personalized faith training plan. Um, I know Dave uses those questions to kind of help gear something towards yep. you individually. Yep, definitely. What else do we have? Palm Sunday pilgrimage. You guys, a lot of churches, Easter is their big service. Our big service, it's I feel Palm like, is Sunday, Palm Sunday. For sure. Um, Easter is kind of like Sunday best and pastels, and that's not our personality. We are loud, and we are Very much in your so. face, and that's what we do on Palm Sunday. So we're planning a big service. We're also planning a pilgrimage. Now, nothing official is going to be orchestrated, so if you guys want to walk to church, if you're coming here in person, then please walk from home or hook up with some friends and walk from their house. Um, I live 20 miles away, so we... One year, a couple years, we walked from home, and I thought I was going to die. Yeah, don't let Pastor fool you. He parks usually in front of my parents' house and walks from our house. We're kind of closer. He likes to think that, like, show doesn't say anything that he fairness, walks 20 miles. And he has miles. to get here very early. He does get here very early. The kids and I usually go to uh, uh, the Rusty Nail. Oh, What's yeah. That? That's it was in like a, uh, Richmond. Yeah, so yeah. we walk from Richmond. It's about 10 miles. That's a, that's and it's a, a great a walk. Hike. It's a great walk. If you guys are not coming in person and you're still, like, worshiping with us at home, do a pilgrimage around your neighborhood. Yeah. You know, an hour before service, mm -hmm. walk your neighborhood and pray for the houses and your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Be loud. Be obnoxious. Wake yes. everybody up. Yes. That's one. It's, Palm Sunday is my, one of my favorite Sundays of the year. It is I try favorite. to walk as much as I can. And it does not sound like fun, but it's a great time. It we is. Always have it a, is. a really good time when we walk. Dave also puts together a, like a pilgrimage prayer guide mm -hmm. or psalm guide or something like that. Right. If you want one of those, you can go to the Fellowship of Faith page, contact us, and, okay. and get signed up for our weekly newsletter, and you'll get it that way. Otherwise, if you don't want our weekly newsletter for whatever reason, then you can... Um, just Ask go yourself, on our website, and first, I think, and why not? <laughs> why not? Um, but anyway, if you're not on our weekly newsletter, I, I, Dave told me that that guide will be on the website later this week. Okay, awesome. So just check our website. All right, we got the stuff out of the way. Everything. Yep, I think so. Isaiah, let's talk about Isaiah. Let's do it. You guys, I was beat tired this morning. I, between working, like yesterday was the longest day I've ever worked in my entire life, and then the, the time, time changed. Change. I was just beat tired, and. <sighs> I've got no energy for this show. Yeah, I, I just don't. Sorry, guys. But and then Dave gave us the like the sermon outline kind yep. of stuff, and I'm like, wait, this is what we're talking. And I literally jumped up and down because I'm so excited about Isaiah. She but did jump up and down. I, I can confirm. It's that. a little bit embarrassing, and I just no, cannot not control myself. The God who suffers with us. How do you respond to that? Well, it's interesting that he brought it up during a service too. That you know, for me as a Christian, part of my struggle is I like to carp. I like to keep my struggles inside. I don't like to share sure. them with anybody. I don't want to bear anybody down. 
And I feel like with God, he's, he's got everyone's struggles. He takes on the whole world's struggles. And I'm like, why would I want to bother him with mine? So I try yeah. to keep it in until the point where I can't do that anymore. And he ends up getting it anyways. Yeah. But it's good to remember that he's suffering for us. Like he is not like we're not suffering by ourselves. He's suffering for us. Like I mentioned in the pre-show. And it's good to remember that this is what he's here for. You know, he is here for yeah. us, knowing that we can't do it by ourselves. So we yeah. need to trust that he is there to help us through yeah. that. I was listening to Catholic Radio a couple of days ago. Hmm. Okay, you didn't know what Moody Radio was. It's a radio station yeah. in the Chicagoland area based mm -hmm. out of um, Moody College, Moody Seminary okay. in Chicago. Anyway, so I also listened to Catholic Radio, which is weird, but <laughs> Catholic Radio rocks. You, I mean, you got to understand, like, the Catholic perspective. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're like, wait, did you really say that? <laughs> but Catholic Radio is great. And there was a lady talking, gosh, I think it was just yesterday, who grew up in Turkey as a... Buddhist, Muslim, Muslim. I'm sure Muslim. Muslim that's, yep, that's her. Um, and eventually became an atheist because she realized that the, the Muslim teaching wasn't right. And, right. Um, and then from there, started working with a Christian family, like just for her job, and ended up coming to no faith. And one of the things that she said that she always struggled with the Christian teachings mm -hmm. is that why did Jesus have to die? I mean, really why why and she didn't understand the concept of like original sin and if you guys read through isaiah the very early on chapters really really kind of gets to that mm -hmm. and you kind of really like oh my gosh i am broken yep I I extremely broken right and in ways that you don't even realize no, exactly. and, and how much of that is I'm hurt because I'm broken. How much is it I am hurt because the other people are broken? And, and this, this concept of original sin, once you realize that and you realize how broken of a world we are, then you all of a sudden realize this deep, deep need for a savior because we can't do it right. at all. Exactly. At all. And then all of a sudden you have this God who's not distant. I love that. What did Dave say? Hang on. Uh, that God... Hang on. He's, God is not above it all. He's not detached. He's not an unmoved mover. That was a... Um, yes, an unmoved mover. That struck me Abraham too. Abraham Heschel, which was a phenomenal name. But I think that was also Einstein. Mm, got me there. But anyway, that is not God. God is the one who gets moved by us. Right. And how incredible that it's not that he's manipulated by us. You know, I can be moved for people and I realize I'm being manipulated by their emotions right. or how many husbands have gotten upset because their wife cries and now I have to do what they say. You know, I feel like I'm being manipulated. Exactly. Right. But God, God is moved by us, but he's not manipulated by us. And in his being moved for us, he acts on our behalf. Right. Ah. And if there's an interesting story, I think I correlated to yeah. this teachings. Um, the movie Hacksaw Ridge, are you familiar with it? Yes. The World War II medic. Yeah, didn't yeah. Have a, it's my favorite movie. He was the, the anti-violence guy. Yeah, and he didn't yeah. carry a weapon into battle, and yeah. he saved like 82-something people. In yeah. night. It's pretty. It's awesome, awesome story. But he was a firm believer in God, yeah. and he said that the only reason why he was able to get through it was because of God. And the actor who played him in the movie was uh -huh. an atheist before the movie was filmed. And after he heard his story and talked with the, the Medal real of person. Honor, so yeah, Desmond Doss, I think is his name, he turned to Christ, his life to Christ, and he's like, I can't believe wow. how this story moved me. And I think this is God's way of showing us that yet what he did was through God. He, what Desmond did was through the yeah. power of God, and, and Desmond never lost faith no matter what he saw. He never yeah. lost faith. Never what happened to him in the Army, everything, never lost faith. And that's what turned hmm. an atheist towards God. Hmm. To realize he'd gone through this hell, so to speak, yeah. and, and he never lost his faith. Yeah. That's interesting. I kind of correlate it's the Andrew two. Garfunkel. That was the actor, Garfield. right? Garfield. Garfield. Yeah, Garfield. Garfunkel. Andrew Garfield. Yeah. It's a really cool story. Huh. That is interesting. And I love the idea. Okay, so the, 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 the real person in the movie yeah. who didn't lose faith and who went mm -hmm. to war without a weapon and all this kind of stuff, that's quite an extreme story. That's Definitely. a story of that's faith. That's an extreme of, faith right there. Yes. Um, you don't have to have that kind of faith in order to be a phenomenal witness to people. Definitely. I mean, even talking about this Palm Sunday pilgrimage, just praying for your neighbors, yeah. that it shows your faith. Right. And all of a sudden, people are like, hey, you're a little bit different. And I noticed that you're like praying. That's kind of weird. But I look at your life, and, and there's something there that I'm interested in. Something as simple as praying for people. Or uh, just keeping the faith through a struggle through a personal yeah. tragedy or a family tragedy. Definitely. We've had that in my family plenty of times. We've shown that our we've grown closer yeah. to tragedy, and people are like, wow, yeah. I want that. And then, 
And you guys have had some big tragedy. Uh, yeah, unfortunately yeah. so. We don't need to go into that now, but. But that's, I think that's the main reason I'm talking about through Jordan's funeral, my yeah. brother who passed away. Yeah. Our family was so strong in our faith that it inspired all others to Well, and, and I remember his theirs. funeral was Cubs, right? Everybody yeah. had the Cubs yeah. hats yeah, on yeah, yeah. and Cubs gear. And, and worship music. It was and very how do you how do you worship when you've lost your son and you've lost mm. your brother mm -hmm. and after such a difficult life anyway? Yeah. He's had I, a lot of health issues. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I remember very vividly your family being like, no, we're celebrating right. because this is he's a celebration. whole now. Right, and exactly. That's exactly what we talked yeah. about, too, is he is no longer suffering and he is yeah. a whole person. I, I, what a kid is supposed to be that is yeah. what he is right now and that's what we tried to remember through that time and it just grew yeah. our faith we could not have done it without well, faith and, for sure. and one of the things too is um you know god uh, one of the things that dave said today is mm -hmm. like oh you've got three options do you choose the suffering route you know people don't choose the suffering no. route, but god did for us mm -hmm. and and if you talk to people who have suffered or are currently in the midst of suffering they will frequently christians they will frequently say, this is when I was closest to God. Oh, definitely. And, and, and a lot of people have said, I would never choose to do that suffering again, but I wouldn't change it. Right. And it rem reminds me of a, I don't know if it's a verse or just a saying, uh, the footprint saying. Are you uh -huh. familiar with that? My grandma gave me a yeah. devotional with that, and it was one of my favorite. I just love reading that, that saying over yeah. and over again. You know, there's two sets of footprints in the sand. Why did you leave me? He's like, I never left you. I was carrying you through that time when there's only one set. You know, yeah. Paraphrasing, of course. Yeah. But that's something to remember that he... He's never gone. He's never, never gone. Ever gone. Yeah. And he's always going to be strong enough to help us through whatever yeah. we're going through. Yeah. In uh, the, the sermon today, <laughs> before the service, I was like, oh, this is Isaiah 52. And I started reading it and I started bouncing because I yeah. was excited. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dave started a little bit past one of my favorite verses on there. So I'm going to talk about it because it ties in a little bit yeah, with this. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's at, I got to change my notes here. It's Isaiah 52, 2. And, and the verses, um, was awake awake, 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 which was good for me this morning because I was super tired. <laughs> but and then it says, "Rise up, sit enthroned." And what we have to realize is that before in Isaiah in chapter three, toward the end of chapter three, Isaiah really kind of comes down on the Israelites, and he's like, "The woman," he says, "The, the daughters of Zion are haughty. Um, they're they're proud, proud. They're arrogant. Everything that." that God's people are not supposed to be, this is what you guys are. And then he goes through a whole litany of, you know, instead of all of this beauty, you're going to have shame. Instead mm -hmm. of, you know, attire made for a bride, you're going to have sackcloth. And, and, and just really line after line after line just really mm -hmm. knocks down any of Israel's pride, any of it. Yep. And at the end of this whole long litany, it says, your men will die by the sword and the woman destitute, they will sit on the ground. And that is such a vivid image for me. Just, I have nothing left. I have no one to protect me, no one to provide for me. I'm just going to sit on, on the ground right. in the dust and, and wait to die. Everything was stripped. And, and, and you, when you realize that you're at that point, you're like, okay, now what do I have? And then throughout Isaiah, he's constantly saying, but God is here for you. God is working. God is working. And then you come to Isaiah 52 where God is suffering with you. With you. God is suffering for you and on your behalf. And then in Isaiah 52, 2, it says, rise up, sit enthroned. You are no longer in the dust. You are, you are sitting on the throne. And by God participating in our suffering, we get to participate in his holiness. Exactly. And I like that he added in the, the rebuild part, the rise yes. up part. After you were stricken down, he didn't leave it at that. Yes. He builds you back up and he to... Doesn't, and, and, and he's with you in your suffering, but he doesn't stay there with you. Right. I mean, he doesn't leave you there either. He, he, he brings you back up to his... Right. Exactly. Even better than where you were before you... Guys, you need to read Isaiah. It will mess you up in all the right ways. That's Isaiah great. Phenomenal. Fantastic. Last, or last week. Next week is going to be the fifth song. Fifth and final And final, song? which yeah. makes me so sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, five songs, obviously. Fifth and five final. Five songs. So we would love you guys to come back next week for the fifth song. Please do. We're excited to talk to you yeah. about do it. Do we need to give a shout-out to anybody today? No shout-outs today. Okay. Oh, some, I was told lovingly today that we need to come up with a name. We're taking too long to come up with a name. So if you guys, the next couple weeks, send in some suggestions for us, and okay. we will pick a name. We're, we got to come up with It's hard to come up with a name. I know. It's tough to choose, too. I think it should be the after show. Woo-woo. <laughs> with the woo-woo. With the woo. -woo. With the yeah. I like, okay. That's, that's one option. <laughs> woo-woo. But uh, we'd love to see what you guys think, and yes. hopefully we can come up with a name. We'll see you next week, guys. Take care. Have a great one.